Hello everyone and welcome back to the Shimazu Introduction to Liquid Chromatography series. Today's webinar will build on the knowledge gained during sessions one and two. As such, today's session will explore the process of LC separation, specifically with regards to reverse phased high performance liquid chromatography or RP HPLC. This series of webinars continues from our last session entitled Types of Liquid Chromatography and Separation Techniques. Today's session discussing the process of LC separation is specifically looking at reverse phased high performance liquid chromatography. We will look at the typical stationary phase interactions which occur in reverse phased HPLC and introduce some common and very important terms used with this type of liquid chromatography. Our future sessions will build upon this knowledge. Stay tuned for sessions on issues such as building and optimising your method, as well as troubleshooting data issues and an introduction to UHPLC. Let's begin our session with a brief recap of our first and second sessions. As part of the first webinar, we learnt that the inside of a liquid chromatography column is packed with particles usually silica in nature. These particles in modern columns are spherical and uniform. The inside of these particles is like a network of pathways, similar to the structure of honeycomb. Along the outside of these particles, as well as the walls of the pathways, we can attach functional groups. This is known as the stationary phase and will differ depending on the type of liquid chromatography. The second webinar looked at the common different types of liquid chromatography. These included iron chromatography, size exclusion, normal phase and reversed phase chromatography. As part of each of these types of liquid chromatography, we looked at what types of columns are used and how the separation is achieved. Also during the second webinar, we discussed what affects the separation. For reverse phase chromatography, we looked at solvent composition. How for two analytes, by reducing the strength of the mobile phase, that is having a lower percentage of methanol to water in our mobile phase, we could increase the separation between these two analytes. We also looked at the effect of pH. Depending on the pH of the mobile phase, analytes will be in their charged or neutral state, which can affect peak shape and retention. We also looked at temperature, showing the importance of keeping temperature constant for good repeatability. Having recapped on our last sessions, we will move on to today's content, the process of LC separation, specifically with regards to reverse phase high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC. But a number of the concepts are typical for other types of liquid chromatography. This is a representation of what is going on inside an LC column. The stationary phase is attached to silica particles and this is the direction of flow of the mobile phase. If we inject a sample of these three analytes, they will start to move down the column, either interacting with the stationary phase or being carried along by the flow of the mobile phase. If we stop the flow at this point, we can see that the three analytes are in different positions down the column. This red analyte here has had the least interaction with the stationary phase and is eluting first. It has the shortest retention time. This green analyte has had more interaction with the stationary phase, but if flow was allowed to continue, it would elute next. This blue analyte has had the most interaction with the stationary phase. So if flow was allowed to continue, it would elute last. It has the longest retention time. The chromatogram for this separation may look something similar to this. Red analyte eluting first with the shortest retention time, then the green analyte, and finally the blue analyte, which has the longest retention time. The separation of analytes by HPLC depends on the interaction of analyte molecules with the stationary phase and the mobile phase. 
To think of this in a different way, let's consider what is happening in a liquid-liquid separation. If we take a separating funnel and fill it with an aqueous solution and an immiscible organic solvent, then we create two layers. If we then introduce a number of different compounds, shake and allow the two layers to settle back out again, depending on the nature of each compound, we would find a higher concentration of each one in either the aqueous layer or the organic layer. Compounds which are polar, hydrophilic or ionic in nature are likely to favour the aqueous layer over the organic layer. Whereas compounds which are fatty, hydrophobic or non-polar in nature are likely to favour the organic layer over the aqueous layer. So benzoapyrene and oleic acid, which are very fatty compounds, favour the organic layer and sucrose, which is very polar, favours the aqueous layer. The partition coefficient, P, is equal to the solubility of a compound in the organic layer divided by the solubility of a compound in the aqueous layer. If the organic and aqueous layers are octanol and water respectively, then the log P of a compound is equal to the log of the concentration of solute in octanol divided by the concentration of the solute in water. A log P figure greater than 2 would suggest a fatty, hydrophobic compound whereas a number close to zero or negative would suggest a polar hydrophilic compound. How do we relate the concept of log P and liquid-liquid separation described on the previous slide to reversed phase HPLC? Well, think of the stationary phase, in this case C18 bonded silica, as the organic layer, and the mobile phase, in this case a mixture of water and methanol, as the aqueous layer. Using the same analytes as before as an example, any that are fatty or hydrophobic will have a strong attraction for the stationary phase, and any that are polar or hydrophilic will have a weaker attraction for the stationary phase and will remain in the mobile phase. As the mobile phase is moving, analytes not attracted to the stationary phase will elute faster from the column. Let's have a look at the types of interactions we can expect between analytes and the stationary phase in reversed phase HPLC. In any separation, we almost never get a pure single mode of interaction. In reversed phase, any separation will be dictated by a mixture of hydrophobic interactions, polar interactions and ionic interactions. Hydrophobic is the major interaction. These are weak transient interactions between non-polar stationary phase and the analytes. Retention will be predicted by log p values of analytes. Ionic interactions are between ionizable functional groups on the analyte and countercharged species on the stationary phase. Ion exchange interactions are strong, slow interactions and can hugely affect peak shapes in reverse phase HPLC separations. Polar interactions are between polar functional groups of the analyte and residue silanols or polar groups on the particle surfaces. Polar interactions include hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole interactions. They are relatively weak and transient but can significantly contribute towards selectivity in reverse phase HPLC separations. I now want to introduce a number of terms and concepts which should be understood to continue building your knowledge in HPLC. The two example chromatograms on the slide show a number of similarities as well as differences. What is the same between these two chromatograms is the retention time and therefore retention factor of each of the four peaks. We can also say that the selectivity is the same between the two chromatograms. Each peak elutes in the same order. What is different is the peak width, in this example measured at half the peak height. Because the width of these two peaks is different but the retention time is the same, we can also say that the peak efficiency is different. Lastly is resolution which is a measure of how well two peaks are clearly separated. This is also different between these two chromatograms. 
before we discuss retention factor, selectivity, efficiency and resolution in more detail, the fundamental concept of the void volume should be understood. There is a volume within any column which is not occupied by the particles. This volume is occupied by the mobile phase and is found in the space between the particles, called the interstitial volume, and the space in the pores of the particles. This space is called the void volume. Analytes which do not interact with the stationary phase are looped from the column in a volume equal to the void volume in the column. Looking at the chromatogram on the screen as an example, the peak of two minutes is marking our void volume. The time this peak takes to elute is known as T0 or T0. In reverse phase HPLC, we often use uracil as an unretained analyte to calculate the void volume at T0. At a flow rate of one milliliter per minute, a two milliliter void volume would give a T0 of two minutes. Increasing the flow rate would decrease the value of T0 and decreasing the flow rate would increase the value of T0, but the actual void volume remains constant. The retention factor K, or capacity factor K prime, for a given analyte will be determined by its relative affinity for the stationary phase and mobile phase. If we look at the example chromatogram, we can calculate the retention factor of each peak using this equation. We need to know the time at which the unretained analyte elutes and the time at which our analyte of interest elutes. Using the equation, this then gives us our retention factor, k. The same can be done for the remaining peaks in the chromatogram. We will have a look at the influence retention factor has on resolution a little later in this webinar. But ideally, the retention factor value for each peak of interest in our chromatogram should be greater than 2, but less than 10. Selectivity, alpha, is a measure of the difference in the interactions of two analytes with the stationary phase, and is a function of both the stationary phase and the mobile phase. Calculating the selectivity value between two peaks is simply a case of dividing the retention factor of the later eluting peak by the retention factor of the earlier eluting peak. For this example, the alpha value between peaks 1 and 2 is 2.2, and between 2 and 3 is 1.54. If we now look back at these two sample chromatograms, we can clearly see why the retention factor and the selectivity of peaks in the top and bottom chromatograms are the same. This is because retention factor and selectivity are only related to analyte retention time and not how wide the peaks are. Peak width affects efficiency and also resolution, but how? Efficiency n can be calculated using this equation. What we need is a value for the retention time, TR, and the peak width. This particular equation uses the value for the peak width at half height, but other equations use the peak width at 10% height or the tangent width. The value this equation gives is the number of theoretical plates for the column which generated the peak. So if we take a column, we can think of it as theoretically containing a number of plates equal to n. If we now look at a narrower peak, if this elutes at the same retention time as before, then the efficiency n, or the number of theoretical plates in this column, is higher. If we know the length of the columns, l, then the column length divided by the plate count gives us h, plate height, or the height equivalent to a theoretical plate. The plate height h is simply the distance between two theoretical plates in a column. The smaller this plate height, the more theoretical plates can fit in a column, the higher the efficiency and the narrower the peak width. Comparing typical chromatograms we would see for each of these columns shows a column with lower efficiency at the top with broader peaks, and a column with higher efficiency at the bottom with narrower peaks. 
So how do we make the step to narrower peaks and higher efficiencies? Well, typically, we go from larger particle sizes to smaller particle sizes, but by going from irregular to spherical regular particles and increasing the uniformity of the packed bed inside a column can also dramatically increase efficiency. To fully understand how to increase efficiency in our separations, we need to understand what factors are behind peak broadening within columns. This is where the Van Diemter equation comes in. Shown here is the simplified version of the Van Diemter equation for plate height and explains the sources for band broadening and efficiency loss during a separation. Plate height h is equal to the contribution from three terms, the a term, the b term and the c term. If we can keep the contribution of each of these terms to band broadening to a minimum, then plate height remains low and plate number and therefore efficiency high. The first term, the A term, is called eddy diffusion or the multi-path effect. If we consider a section of this column and a tight band of analyte at the top, band broadening due to eddy diffusion is caused when analytes have the opportunity to take multiple different paths throughout the column when traveling through the interstitial space between the particles. The smaller the particles, the tighter the particle size distribution, the more uniform the particles are, the more homogeneous the interstitial space between the particles is. This results in less variation in path lengths that analytes can travel, which decreases dispersion due to this multi-path effect. The contribution to plate height h from eddy diffusion is independent of flow rate but is dependent on particle size and the uniformity of the column pack bed. The second term, the B term, is called longitudinal diffusion. Again, if we consider a section of this column and a tight band of analyte shown in blue. If the flow of the mobile phase is slow, the slowly moving band of analyte can spread out due to random molecular diffusion. The result is a broad analyte band as it exits the column. However, if the flow of the mobile phase is fast, the fast moving band does not get the opportunity to spread out. The result is a tight band as it exits the column. The contribution to plate height h from longitudinal diffusion is dependent on mobile phase velocity. As the mobile phase velocity increases, the contribution of longitudinal diffusion to plate height becomes negligible. The last term, the C term, or resistance to mass transfer, is sometimes referred to as the rate of diffusion or the kinetics of diffusion. It is typically the largest contributor to increased plate height. It's related to how efficiently and effectively analytes are able to diffuse into and out of the region of the column containing the stationary phase. The path that the analyte takes is known as the diffusion path. The shorter the path length, the less dispersion that takes place between the analytes diffusing into and out of the particle and the analytes being carried by the mobile phase. The contribution to band broadening from resistance to mass transfer is proportional to flow rate. Let's take a look at the effect of band broadening as flow rate is increased. As flow rate is increased, more dispersion takes place between the analytes diffusing into and out of the particle and the analytes being carried by the mobile phase. The effect is a broader, more dispersed analyte band than when flow rate was lower. To run at higher flow rates, the diffusion path length needs to be reduced. This happens as you decrease particle size. The contribution to plate height h from resistance to mass transfer is proportional to the mobile phase velocity. As mobile phase velocity increases, plate height also increases. In order to achieve ultra high efficiencies at high flow rates, fast mass transfer must be achieved. If we put all these terms together and draw the resulting curve, this is what we see. At this point here, we have the lowest plate height or highest plate number and the optimum mobile phase velocity at which this is achieved. By decreasing particle size, we are able to decrease the contribution from the A term due to a decrease in variation of path lengths than analytes can travel.
In addition, decreasing particle size decreases the contribution from the C term due to a decrease in the diffusion path length. The resulting new curve shows a lower plate height at an increased optimal flow rate. So in summary, decreasing particle size decreases plate height, therefore increases plate number or efficiency at higher optimal flow rates. This is an example of three Van Diemter plots for columns of different particle sizes. The top curve is for a column packed with five micron particles. Notice how quickly plate height increases as mobile phase velocity increases. The middle curve is for a column packed with three micron particles. And the bottom curve is for a column packed with 1.9 micron particles. Notice how here increasing the mobile phase velocity beyond the optimal for minimum plate height does not have the dramatic detrimental effect on plate height as seen for 5 micron particles. The efficiencies seen for 3 and 5 micron particles are typically referred to as HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography and the efficiencies seen for 1.9 micron particles or smaller are typically referred to as UHPLC or ultra high performance liquid chromatography. I want to consider resolution and how efficiency, selectivity and retention all contribute towards resolution. But firstly, if we have two peaks, and I know the retention times and peak widths, I can calculate the resolution between them using the equations shown on the slide. Note that this particular form of the equation is used by the United States pharmacopoeia. The European pharmacopoeia and other pharmacopoeias may differ slightly. Shown here are two peaks which are not baseline resolved. They have a resolution of 0.8. Mathematically speaking, a resolution of 1.5 is enough for two peaks to be baseline resolved. In practice, however, a resolution of 1.7 is typically required. The equation for resolution shown in the bottom right corner of the slide demonstrates how efficiency, selectivity and retention all contribute. But this is easier to see when we plot the contribution of each component separately against resolution. Selectivity has the largest influence on resolution at higher values. As we looked at in session 2, separation or selectivity can be changed by switching stationary phase, mobile phase, pH and temperature. Efficiency also has a large influence, but because of the square root term, doubling the efficiency only increases resolution by 1.4 times. As we have just seen, increasing efficiency involves minimising the effect of band broadening in our columns. Retention only has an influence on increasing resolution at lower values. Ideally, the retention factor should be greater than 2 and less than 10. Beyond 10, it has no further influence on increasing resolution. Lastly, as an example of what we can do with our new knowledge. The two chromatograms look fairly similar. They have been run isocratically, meaning the mobile phase composition remains constant throughout the run. The resolution between the first two peaks in each chromatogram is almost the same. And the plate count or efficiency of the large peak here is very close. But the difference is the runtime. The top chromatogram was run in 35 minutes and the bottom in only four minutes. So what have we done? We've gone from using a 5 micron HPLC column, 150 by 46, at 1 milliliter per minute, to using a 1.7 micron UHPLC column, 50 by 3 millimeters, at 1.25 milliliters per minute. We have kept the length to particle diameter ratio the same, or very close, which means the plate count, N, remains constant and we have been able to increase the flow rate as columns packed with smaller particles require higher optimal linear flow velocities as we have just seen. The result is a much faster runtime without a decrease in data quality. But before we all run out and buy short, narrow, 1.7 micron columns, note the pressures involved. Whereas the HPLC separation runs at 66 bar, the UHPLC separation runs at 558 bar. 
and it is not just the pressure. The dwell and dispersion volume of the system needs consideration, as does sample prep. But these are concepts for the next webinar. So in summary of today's session, we have looked at reversed phase chromatography interactions, including hydrophobic, polar and ionic. We introduce some important common terms used in LC. Void volume, T0, retention factor, K, selectivity, alpha, efficiency, N, plate height, H, and resolution, RS. We have shown how decrease in particle size can increase efficiency, how retention factor, selectivity, and efficiency influence resolution, and lastly, how increasing efficiency and therefore resolution allows a reduction in runtime without compromising data quality. If you are finding these webinars helpful, then visit our website for further webinar series, such as cannabis analysis, liquid chromatography purification, gas chromatography, and method development of LCMS methods. Please visit our website www.shimadzu.co.uk forward slash webinars for these other webinar series that are open for registration or available on demand. If you'd like to hear more from Shimadzu, please do join our mailing list. You will receive all the news and product development from us. Look for the link in the follow-up email or go to www.shimadzu.co.uk and click on eNews. You can find us on all the usual social media platforms. Please feel free to contact us should you wish to find out more. That's all from me. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Excellence in Science. Shimazu.